Opinions, options, answers. Voice America Health and Wellness. Welcome to Psychiatry, Ask the Expert, hosted by Dr. Neil Kay. All comments, views, and opinions expressed are solely those of the hosts, guests, and callers. Dr. K will not diagnose or treat callers. The information provided is informational in nature. In the next hour, Dr. K explores the inner workings of the brain and mind. Grab a pen and paper and sit back. Here is your host, Dr. Neil K. Good evening. I'm Dr. Neil K and my co-host Jay Birch, and I want to welcome you all to our show tonight. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening, Neil. Great to see you again this week, Jay. Now, each week on Psychiatry Ask the Expert, we focus on a specific topic in psychiatry. We talk about the disease or illness itself, the common symptoms and presentation of each illness, and, of course, treatment options with a focus on psychopharmacology, medication treatments. We talk about potential risks and benefits, side effects, dosing, and when and how to use the best medications. Tonight, Jay and I are very honored to have my close friend, Dr. Robert Graniker with us. Dr. Graniker is President and Executive Director of the Lexington Forensic Institute in Lexington, Kentucky. Dr. Graniker is a forensic neuropsychiatrist and has been on the faculty of the University of Kentucky College of Medicine for over 25 years. He is a renowned expert in brain injury and has evaluated over 3,000 cases of head injury. His textbook, Traumatic Brain Injury, is one of the best written in this area and often cited by experts. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the cognitive and emotional symptoms of brain injuries, their diagnosis and treatment. Bob, welcome to you. Well, thanks for having me, Neil. It's a a pleasure to be here and an honor. Great. We're glad that you're with us. Listeners, tonight you can call us with questions at any time. The call-in number tonight, 866 472 5792. All right, Neil, let's start with our radar segment. Uh, do you have anything that's been on your radar screen this week? Short list on my radar screen this week, Jay. Uh, today's uh, report that NSAM has just been approved. This is the first antidepressant in patch form, and that's going to be a breakthrough because a lot of people like the idea of patches. Patches uh, allow us to deliver medication into a patient's system at much lower doses because they bypass the gut and the liver, and so the drug is expected to have very limited side effects as a profile. It's not supposed to have sexual side effects or weight gain. Uh, I expect this drug to do very well, and I did some of the earlier research on this for its manufacture. And that's really the uh, most exciting thing on my screen this week. What about yours? Well, Neil, uh, I was attracted to the Wall Street Journal myself uh, today, the, the front page article entitled, In Study of Women's Health, Design Flaws Raise raise Questions. And I want to ask you to comment briefly, and and maybe on on a later show we can talk about this a little bit more in depth. But basically, here's the situation. Fifteen years and $725 million of taxpayer money was invested uh, since 1991 in this Women's Health Initiative. And the study results, while they have been interesting, have been less than conclusive. For example, the NIH has announced that findings that menopause hormones are risky and don't protect the heart, that low-fat diets don't fight breast cancer or heart disease, and that taking calcium and vitamin D doesn't protect bones or prevent colorectal cancer. However, the controversy arises in how these studies were constructed and conducted. I'll give you an example. In the in the nutrition study, they didn't reveal the full effect of a low low fat diet because most of the women didn't stick to one. The bid to measure the effect of taking calcium and vitamin D suffered because a majority of test subjects, including those uh, given a placebo, were allowed to take calcium supplements on the side. And the hormone study was heavily weighted to older women long past menopause. So, Neil, my question is this. We have studies, uh, you know, in mental health, in, in, in medical health that come out. A lot of money gets spent either by the government, by a pharmaceutical manufacturer or someone. How is it that the average citizen out there looking to be conducting themselves in a, in a healthy way can trust the information, or where can they really get information they can rely on? Well, part of the problem you're seeing is just the problem of science itself, that it's very difficult to conduct a completely clean study. In fact, I would argue that there's never been a perfect study. 
there really can't be, especially one where human behavior is part of the study methodology, where people have to follow things which they may or may not actually follow. When you're trying to control for multiple variables, it gets even more complex. But the question about how does a, uh, a citizen, a consumer, a patient try to actually do what's best, I think they should apprise themselves of the, the literature uh, the best that they can. I think they need to talk with this uh, with their doctors about what they're reading and get their doctor's advice on it because doctors hopefully are staying current or reading a lot of different literature and seeing multiple facets. Now, of course, sometimes things change, and this can be confusing. You know, the coffee is good for you, coffee is bad for you, coffee is good for you, well, coffee doesn't matter, and now maybe it's good for you again. And the fact is, in science, we're willing to put up a theory and challenge it. The other thing that comes in is that the media tends to jump on the latest story. Whoever has the latest story, that's the newest and the best, and that's kind of an American phenomenon. And frequently, newest is not the best, whether it's a new product, laundry detergent, or a, or a pharmaceutical agent. Newer isn't always better. And even in research, the newest study isn't necessarily the best study. It's simply the newest, but it's the one that's on everybody's mind in a media-focused world that uh, that we've got. And I know that, that you have something that has been consistently shown to be very healthy regardless of what study you look at. Do you want to care to mention that? Absolutely. One substance that has shown a positive effect on health in every study ever done on it is dark chocolate and cocoa. So for all of our chocolate lovers out there, and that's the dark chocolate, not the milk chocolate. That's got all those emulsifiers in it. But dark chocolate, always a good thing. You should always have a little bit of that with you just in case. Um, so that's it for the Omni Radar segment tonight, I think. Thanks, Neil. That's great. Uh, Bob, in your introduction, I introduced you as a forensic neuropsychiatrist. You think you can explain to the audience what that is? Yeah, let me work backwards and, and take those uh, two words apart. Let's do the neuropsychiatrist part first. Uh, psychiatry, I think, is probably understood by most people, but for those that don't know it, it's a medical specialty. It's the branch of medicine that deals with behavior of the mind and the brain. It requires a medical degree uh, and then extra training called a residency to be a psychiatrist. However, there's a new field that's emerged in the last 30 to 40 years just getting significant recognition, and that's neuropsychiatry. The neuropsychiatrist is like an ordinary psychiatrist but has special training and experience in disorders that arise solely from brain tissue, organic conditions, things like traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's disease, depression associated with Parkinsonism, uh, the mental difficulties of a person with multiple sclerosis lesions in the brain. Those would come under the purview of neuropsychiatry. Then forensic is like CSI. Uh, there are two forensic specialties in medicine. The first is forensic pathologists, they're medical examiners. The second are forensic psychiatrists. We deal with the behavior part. So we are physicians, psychiatrists that are trained uh, to present evidence and analyze evidence for triers of fact, judges and juries. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. Uh, now tell us a little bit about a traumatic brain injury. What is that? Can you define it, explain it for our audience? Well, a traumatic brain injury comes from direct trauma to the head, which is then transmitted into the brain. So it's usually due to a blow or a fall or a penetration of the head by a missile, such as a bullet. Uh, so we distinguish traumatic brain injury from brain injury that you might get uh, from encephalitis, an infection of the brain, or a brain injury that you might be born with because your mother uh, didn't have enough oxygen when you were being delivered, or things of that nature. So it's blunt force trauma or penetration of the head causing direct injury to the underlying brain tissue. Now, there's a variety of terms out there. Traumatic brain injury, we just use that one. You also hear the term closed head injury and post-concussion syndrome. Um, are these the same or are these different? They're, uh, they're qualitatively different, Neil. Closed head injury uh, means just what it said. The head was injured without fracturing or opening the skull. So in other words, the head remained closed. Now it may or may not result 
in a traumatic brain injury. Uh, stop and th- think, or let's have our listeners think about this. You know, some kid uh, in New Jersey or Colorado playing uh, football on Friday night wearing a helmet gets his bell rung. That's a closed head injury. In most cases, that does not result in a brain injury. On the other hand, let's take those same young men playing football, and a lineman gets hit viciously by a uh, linebacker, and his bell is not only rung, he has to go to the sidelines, he can't remember the plays, he can't remember that he was in the game, Uh, he has double vision, and uh, the coach has the trainer or doctor assess him and says, young man, you know, you can't go back in the game. Then he gets a medical exam the next day, and the doctor says, you better not play football for a couple of weeks. The young man may end up with headaches, nausea, feeling out of sorts, feeling confused, feeling as if his mind is working too slow. That would be a post-concussion syndrome, generally disappears over time, and usually does not result in a permanent injury. Okay, so injury might be permanent or not permanent. Are there different severities to head injury? Yes, uh, you know, Neil, uh, we physicians tend to use three terms for severity, mild, moderate, and severe. Those are clumsy terms. They don't have good boundaries, and they don't have good definitions. Uh, That's about the best we can do. Uh, In head injury, there have been various ways to try to assign percentages and say whether an injury is mild, moderate, or severe, things such as the Glasgow Coma Scale, which you may or may not want to talk about, uh, other measures based on certain types of psychological testing, but there's no good way to classify them. But generally, we we call them mild, moderate, or severe. Does uh, does mild, moderate, or severe have any influence on prognosis, on what's going to happen down the road with a person? Yes, it does. Uh, a severe head injury, that is one where you have clear uh, evidence of structural brain damage on an MRI or a CT uh, scan of the head, uh, that results uh, in problems for the person throughout life generally. Uh, Various cognitive disorders such as memory dysfunction, difficulty uh, planning and organizing one's life, uh, difficulty using language, uh, those can take a person out of the workforce and, if severe enough, can require the individual to be cared for by other people. All right, we're going to be going to break. After break, we're going to be continuing with Dr. Graniker on Psychiatry Ask the Expert. We're going to be talking more about head injury and the presentation of head injury. We'll be going to break now. Real Life Solutions, Voice America Health and Wellness. To perform at your maximum potential, you need to have all aspects of your life working properly. On Mind, Brain, and Body, Dr. Michael John Kell will bring you honest, open discussions concerning your physical, mental, and financial health. If you're ready to find purpose and meaning in your life, tune in to Mind, Brain, and Body every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific. Mind, Brain, and Body on Voice America Health and Wellness. Radio dedicated to your health, wealth, wisdom, and purpose. Videos de aprendizaje de inglés. Máxima calidad. Nunca escucharás a alguien vendiendo educación en la calle, pero con programas familiares gratuitos sí puedes obtener la educación que necesitas. Llame al 1-877-326-5481 para información sobre programas gratuitos de educación familiar. Mira, vengan aquí. Obtengo un mejor vocabulario en inglés garantizado. El primer paso a una vida mejor. Un mensaje del National Center for Family Literacy y el Art Council. 
Achieve exceptional levels of health and fitness through integrating the very best in fitness, nutrition, and healing. Tune into Total Fitness with fitness, nutrition, and healing coaches Catherine Kerrigan and James Williams. Each week, get inspired to exercise, eat and rest in harmony with your body's needs, and take advantage of effective natural healing methods with in-depth, cutting-edge information and advice. Get fit, get healthy, get motivated, and get real with Total Fitness, broadcasting every Friday at 7 a.m. on Voice America Health & Wellness. Are you tired of being tired? Are you sick of sitting around while life passes you by? You can get back on track by tuning in to Voice America Health & Wellness every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Time for Attracting Abundance, the Energy of Success with Carol Look. Attracting Abundance is the program that empowers you to finally break through your limiting beliefs and blocks and shows you how to succeed in all areas of your life, from improved financial abundance, health and weight problems, as well as your relationships. Don't wait another week to be joyful. Listen to Attracting Abundance, the Energy of Success with Carol Look, this Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Time, right here on Voice America Health & Wellness. Parents, did you know that high school dropouts make 42% less than graduates? Someone will have to make up that difference, and chances are, that will be you. That means paying 42% of their groceries. Ooh, more candy. 42% of their dentist bills. No, no more candy. Even 42% of their therapy sessions. Oh, my dad's fault. Save your money. Encourage your kids to stay in school. For help and advice, call 877-F-O-R-A-K-I-D. A message from the U.S. Army and the Ad Council. A fresh look at today's health. Voice America Health and Wellness. Welcome back to Psychiatry Ask the Expert. If you have a question or comment, dial toll-free at one 866 Three six nine three seven four two. Now back to the show. Here's Dr. K. Hi, it's Jay Birch uh, here with Dr. Neil K. on Psychiatry as the Expert with Bob Graniker. This evening, Dr. Bob Graniker, we're talking about traumatic brain injuries. Bob, before we went to break, you were talking about the difference between mild, moderate, and severe head injuries. You discussed the situation with uh, potential high school or college or even professional football players. My question is, what's the, what's the impact, pardon the pun, of repetitive traumatic brain injuries that uh, a lot of athletes may, may encounter in their careers? Jay, that's an excellent question. Uh, the, Im- the impact, uh, no pun intended, is serious. It, it, with a repetitive injury, let's say you have a severe concussion that takes you out of the uh, game of hockey or professional football for a week or two, and then you have a second major concussion, and maybe later on a third. It works like this, Jay. One plus one doesn't equal two. It equals three for, for two concussions. And for three concussions or three significant closed head injuries with alteration of consciousness, one plus one plus one might equal five. Uh, Those mathematicians in our listening audience will understand that it's an exponential increase, not a linear increase. Very dangerous situation. And is there a a difference that I'm thinking particularly because... uh... The Philadelphia Flyers, Keith Primo, today announced that he would be sitting out the rest of this season because he had a concussion early in the in the hockey season this year, having not played at all last year, but he had a concussion the year before that. So he actually has played just a few games, sat out now for about six months. In the in the long term, when or even in the short term, let me, let me phrase it that way. In the short term, when somebody gets cleared to play, and I don't want to stress too much about athletics, but somebody gets cleared to play, that's not the same as you are 100% healed, you never have any sequelae of uh, last week's concussion. Is that correct? That's correct, Jay. Not at all. Uh, There's a, a lot of inside information that never comes to the public about professional sports. Uh, there is what's called the Pittsburgh Steelers Neuropsychological Screening Examination that is used uh, to determine when players can return to professional football. I don't know if professional hockey has the same thing. But it, the just the mere fact that, you're, that you go back near to baseline on these uh, neuropsychological tests, uh, that's not good enough for me. Uh, since I don't make my living that way, I... I don't have to make that tough decision. But, you know, when you've got a professional player 
that's had his bell rung so many times that he's having significant cognitive problems, he needs to get out of the sport for his own health and well-being and that of his family. Okay. No, Bob, I remember there's some data that looked at boxers and it showed that the likelihood of a head injury and later dementia was correlated with number of rounds in the ring and not necessarily knockouts. Yes. But it also makes me think uh, about some data that I've seen and hope you can elucidate for the audience on uh, how long a period of time transpires between uh, first and second injury or concussions, uh, especially in the high school athlete. We see high school athletes, uh, as you said, they get their bell rung, they get thrown back in the game. This happens, you know, uh, once or twice in a couple-week of period. Does the frequency or time interval between the blows make any difference? It does, Neil, uh, for this reason. When one gets a traumatic brain injury, uh, even if you can't see it on a scan, the injury is initially chemical. So the trauma to the head gets transmitted into the brain and sets off a chemical reaction. Uh, part of that reaction is associated with glutamic acid, which is an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter in the brain. And then there are other issues that occur. Genetic changes can come up to play. Uh, you can actually set off a chain reaction that will begin to kill brain cells. There's no way to really see that. We just know that it happens uh, based on what we've learned experimentally in the laboratory. So my point is the chemical reaction uh, may last for a few days, uh, possibly even out to a few weeks because of inflammatory changes that occur. So back to your question, if you, put, if you get another blow to the head that is harmful during that chemical realteration of the brain, uh, you are likely to catch the brain at a very vulnerable time and magnify the injury. Okay, got you. Last, last question in the sports area, just because it's just so much fun. Soccer is really a big sport up here, and there's been some conflicting data in the literature, as I see it, regarding uh, young kids and even high schoolers heading the ball in soccer and controversy about whether or not this affects things like IQ or neuropsychological performance. What's your view of that controversy right now? Well, we, we, we don't have enough data to give parents a definitive answer on that. Uh, but I think your uh, boxing analogy uh, is worthwhile looking at here. And if you've got a youngster that is headbutting 10, 15 times a game, you know, hitting a ball that many times and does that repeatedly throughout the season and for a number of seasons, Based on what we know about boxers, we would probably say, you know, that 100, 200 hitters in one's uh, high school career is likely to lead to problems versus the kid who only does it maybe 10 times in a career. So it's probably dose-related. In other words, the greater the number of blows, the more likely you end up with a persistent problem. Bob, how does, how does one's age or sex affect susceptibility or likelihood of traumatic brain injury? Age has a great effect. A uh, simple reason for that, Jay. Uh, when we get older, uh, let's say over age 50, we have some brain shrinkage. All of us do. And when we get a little brain shrinkage, the brain pulls away from the inside of the skull so there's more space between the brain tissue and the skull surface. Therefore, if you have a slip and fall or you're in a car wreck, you're more likely to get your brain slapped around violently inside the skull because there's more space available. Also, the integrity of our tissue is not as strong when we're older, so that plays a role. Then we go to the other end of the spectrum. The tiny baby is also very vulnerable. I'm sure both of you know about the shaken baby syndrome and how lethal that can be or harmful that can be. So at the one end of the spectrum, the very young child is very sensitive, and at the other end of the spectrum, the very old person is very sensitive. It's also, I think, that uh, the brain is not as plastic. It doesn't uh, have the ability to uh, reintegrate or for one area of the brain to take over from another area uh, as well uh, when we're older compared to when we're younger. No question about that, Neil. Yeah, that, that's uh, one of the downsides. Now, as to Jay's question about gender or, or the sex of a person, the, the information there is less clear, whether men are more <coughs> prone to effects than women. I don't think so. But if you look at the statistics or epidemiology of brain injury, men are the most likely to be injured because of uh, heavy industry uh, occupations where one's likely to get a, 
a head injury. In my part of the world here in Kentucky, you know, it's not there's not a week goes by that I don't see a coal miner that's been injured in a fall of rock from the roof or a, a large piece of machinery underground uh, crushing the individual or hitting the individual or a mine explosion. Uh, so it, you, that's the gender effect we see is that men are in more dangerous occupations by and large. I don't think being male or female uh, leads to any significant difference. All right, that's good. I want to shift gears with you, Bob. Tell me a little bit about how a person with a traumatic brain injury presents cognitive issues, emotional issues, behavioral changes, and even the psychiatric side of it, since we're all psychiatrists. Um, what do these people look like? Well, they, they're a combination of everything you ask about or only one of the issues you ask about. For instance, you can have someone whose injury primarily presents as a cognitive disorder, whereas another person presents primarily with behavioral problems, and then a third person presents with both. Uh, then in many individuals, brain injury leads to psychiatric illness. Well, let's tease that out a bit. When I say cognitive for our audience, I'm talking about an alteration of basic brain function dealing with attention, memory, executive function, which is planning, organizing, seeing to the future, intellectual capacity, uh, the uh, function of sensory and motor systems, how we feel and how we move, uh, and these, these basic things, in other words, the computer parts of our brain. On the other hand, the behavioral injury uh, will result in an individual with difficulty in mood. They may be depressed. They may be very anxious. Uh, some people get uh, an increase or a new set of obsessive-compulsive symptoms uh, following a brain injury, especially a deep brain injury. Uh, then we can have individuals who have a memory disorder, an executive disorder, and are depressed. Uh, so that's how people will present afterwards, Neil. All right. Well, that's very helpful both for me and the audience. Lots of changes. How about irritability? Very common. Uh, it's one of the commonest things that occurs the individual may be irritable and also impulsive. Uh, it's a, it's a, it can be a significant problem. I saw a 19-year-old young woman yesterday who was in college and uh, was involved in a motor vehicle accident. Unfortunately, she ran her vehicle off the road and T-boned it. And her main problems are now behavioral. And they showed up almost immediately after her injury. When she went to the rehabilitation unit, she became antisocial. Uh, she began hitting people on the ward when they tried to intervene while she was stealing others' credit cards so she could call her boyfriend. She'd never had that kind of behavior before. There is a, a disorder, Neil, known as acquired sociopathy, which occurs from a uh, brain injury in the front of the brain, in the middle, right above the eyes, in an area called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. It can actually make you look like uh, somewhat of an antisocial person. All right, Bob, well, that is fascinating. We're going to be going to break after break. We're going to continue on psychiatry. Ask the expert with Dr. Bob Graniker. Thank you. Opinions, options, answers. Voice America Health and Wellness. Stay mentally, physically, and emotionally fit with Younger Every Day. Hosted by Dr. Bob Payson. Broadcast every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Younger Every Day will offer you alternative solutions for a variety of health issues, all backed by clinical, scientific, and medical data. Dr. Payson and other expert guests will inform and inspire people of all ages to look and feel better. Younger Every Day. Think clear. Feel strong. Grow younger. With Dr. Bob Payson, right here on Voice America Health & Wellness. 
Women, do you feel that you're too old to be active, too old to be beautiful, too old to have fun, or too old to be fabulous? Well, if that's what you think, then there's good news for you. You're wrong. Tune in to Voice America every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for Aging Outside the Box. Fabulous Women Over 50 with Shirley Mitchell. Aging Outside the Box is a fabulous, fun program that gives you every reason to feel greater than you ever have. Host Shirley Mitchell and O.E. Cruiser Small will cover phenomenal topics such as women's issues, health, diet, exercise, nutrition, faith, travel, and many other concerns for women of all ages. Feel young, feel smart, and feel fabulous by tuning in to Aging Outside the Box. Fabulous Women Over 50 with Shirley Mitchell every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Right here on VoiceAmerica.com. Tired of life working out the exact same no matter how much you try to change it? It's time to get a new perspective. Perspectives, Alternatives for Living Life Better with host Margie Sugarman clears the cobwebs of confusion and offers practical solutions to life's issues. Broadcasting every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel, clinical social worker and psychotherapist Margie Sugarman is here so you can make the right physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual choices for your life. Right here on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Perform at your maximum potential, you need to have all aspects of your life working properly. On Mind, Brain, and Body, Dr. Michael John Kell will bring you honest, open discussions concerning your physical, mental, and financial health. If you're ready to find purpose and meaning in your life, tune in to Mind, Brain, and Body every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific. Mind, Brain, and Body on Voice America Health and Wellness. Radio dedicated to your health, wealth, wisdom, and purpose. Step into a healthier you. Voice America Health and Wellness. Welcome back to Psychiatry Ask the Expert. If you have a question or comment, dial toll free at 1 866 369 3742. Now back to the show. Here's Dr. K. Hi, welcome back to Psychiatry Ask the Expert. I'm Dr. K, the host, and we've got uh, Dr. Granica, our expert, with us on the line, and we've got Mary from New Jersey on the other line. Mary, can you hear us tonight? Uh, yes, I can. Go ahead. You want to ask a question to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Braniker? Yes. Um, I, I have a daughter who's about 15, and um, in the fall, playing soccer, she had a basically had an injury, concussion, with a little bit of loss of consciousness, and it seems that now she's not doing as well in school as she had been before. Could that be because of this head injury, and if it is, what should I do? What avenue should I follow to get her help? Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Mary. Yes, it, it could be related to that, assuming that she has no other cause, of course, no other medical illness. But there's no question that that could. Uh, to get her help, you first need to define the problem in your daughter. And I would recommend an evaluation by a neuropsychologist. Now, that's different uh, than those of us that are on the radio show tonight. That's not a medical doctor, but that is a specially trained psychologist who can make measurements in those things I talked about, attention, executive function, memory, etc. And then if you, if you find that there are some problems, you then want to uh, speak with either a neurologist or a psychiatrist that had special skill in traumatic brain injury to see if medication would assist or if she needs help with uh, a type of physical uh, therapy called cognitive rehabilitation. So there are things that could be done, but you're first going to have to define what the problem is and why our grades have changed. Mary, did that cover your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was very helpful. You're well, welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for calling in, Mary. Bob, let me get a little bit of follow-up for Mary's question here. As part of that workup, what about brain scans? Everybody always runs for the CT, the MRI, and I know you and I both do some special scans beyond that. But a lot of times scans seem to come back normal and people get kind of forgotten or whatever. I want to talk a little bit about the workup for brain injury and especially scans and what they do or don't really mean. Yes, Neil, a very good point. Uh, uh, there's one thing, though, that I, I do want to make sure our audience understands. Everybody should have a scan following a significant injury to the head but, uh, to see if there's a, a bleeding or things going on that we need to know about. At the immediate point of injury, let's say you uh, have a, a car wreck and you're taken to the emergency department, the first scan that will probably be ordered is a 
is a CT scan because it's so quick at detecting any form of blood. Once you get down the road from the original impact needle, let's say uh, such as Mary calling in about her daughter, at this point you would, you would want to get an MRI of the brain because the MRI gives us three different views, uh, so we are looking at all three planes, and it also has the ability to do some, some tweaking of the data, if you will. Uh, the MRI looks at signals that come back from the brain, and it's very good at detecting alterations of tissue that you can't see on the CT. Then the, the other scans you know you and I use and, and uh, the audience may or may not be familiar with, you can also check uh, if somebody has a lot of cognitive problems and their uh, CT or MRI doesn't show you anything, you can look at the blood flow in their brain using what's called a SPECT scan, S-P-E-C-T, or another type of scan that looks at how the brain uses uh, sugar or glucose called a PET scan, P-E-T. Uh, those can be useful, uh, but I don't recommend SPECT or PET unless you first made sure the structure is intact, and that would be an MRI. Okay, so we've got these, what you and I would call static imaging, your, your CT and MRI, and then what we call the functional imaging, things that show what's actually going on in the brain. Uh, you didn't mention functional MRI. Any thoughts about that one? Because we're starting to see some of that come about. Yes, uh, and it's an emerging, uh, I'm beginning to, uh, I'm going to be working that into my practice. A functional MRI, so our audience will understand, uh, the MRI looks at the anatomy of the brain, the standard MRI, but the functional MRI is able to actually look at how a certain area is functioning using the same MRI machinery, but by using different software. And it's going to be very useful. The functional MRI is quite useful. And then there's another nuclear magnetic uh, type of study Neil, that has use, uh, the spectroscopy, the mag nuclear magnetic spectroscopy, which actually can look at chemicals. Uh, this is a real CSI type technique. Uh, so you use a, a nuclear magnetic type machine, but it'll look, at, for instance, at a chemical such as choline or a chemical such as lecithin. Uh, these chemicals may be altered when brain tissue is injured and you would be able to detect it chemically where you can't detect it structurally. Okay, and I think that's important that we can't always detect something that's actually there. That was actually, uh, I think, a perfect lead into what I wanted to ask next. In what you and I call mild traumatic brain injury, uh, these are cases where there might or might not be a loss of consciousness. If it is, it's pretty brief. Uh, normally, these people actually don't show much on the way of scans, they may or may not even lose consciousness, as I see it, but they can, in fact, have a bona fide injury. Can you explain that to everybody? Yes. Uh, let's use boxing as an example. If you knock somebody out, you have to hit them in a fashion that transmits energy into the center of the brain, what we call the brain stem, uh, which is above the top of your neck where your spinal cord enters the brain. That area, if it receives energy, is very sensitive to alertness, and we will lose consciousness. On the other hand, I'm now going to tell you something, Neil, I don't want anybody in our audience to try because, it, it's, uh, as you, you'll see, it's dangerous. But you won't lose consciousness. If you take an ice pick and put it over your right temple and then slam the handle of the ice pick with your hand and drive it into the front part of your brain, you probably won't lose consciousness but you certainly have just uh, caused a brain injury. So it depends on what part of the brain is affected on whether we lose consciousness. So then you actually could have a brain injury without a loss of consciousness is what you're saying. Yes. Uh, those in the audience may, may know this obscure case. You and I know the case of Phineas Gage, the Vermont railroader in the middle 1800s who had a tamping iron driven up through his brain that skull now is at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And uh, Phineas never lost consciousness, even though he had a big iron rod sticking out of the top of his head. Okay, so you don't need to lose consciousness. And about in mild TBI, mild traumatic brain injury, about 98% of people have normal CT and MRI scans. Is that right? Yes, that's pretty accurate, Neil. Okay. 
Uh, Jane looks like he wants to ask something. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> waiting for a chance to get a question in here edgewise. Bob, I'm interested in the relationship between traumatic brain injury and one's genetic predisposition perhaps to, say, another mental illness, maybe schizophrenia, perhaps Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and explain it to me. Does, does the injury either exaggerate or exacerbate or accelerate uh, one's propensity toward other problems? Yes, it does, Jay. It's an excellent question. You can actually predict the severity of what's going to happen to you later in life following a brain injury by a simple blood test. You take a blood test, and you have to send it to a reference laboratory, and you measure a substance called apolipoprotein. It's kind of a cholesterol-like substance, but it's a bit different. And there are three forms of this that appear in humans. There is the E2 E3 or E4. Now, the 2 and 3 forms don't seem to cause any significant alteration in how you uh, turn out following an injury. If, however, you've got this number 4, that's bad news. Now, here's how it works, Jay. Let's say that you're in a car wreck and you uh, get a significant traumatic brain injury and you bleed into your brain and you have to go to a neurosurgical unit. And let's say there are two accidents like that that occur in the same city. Uh, let's say we're in uh, downtown Chicago, and we have these two accidents occurred at exactly the same time in two different automobiles, and both of these individuals bleed in exactly the same part of their brain, and they're taken to a good neurosurgical service in Chicago. If you do a blood test and find that the first person has E2 and the second person has E4, the person with E4 will do worse than the person with E2, even though they have equivalent injuries. Well, wow. Now, the E4, that's the, uh, that's the one that's related to Alzheimer's also, Bob? Yes, it is. Uh, it, it is a, a marker for people who will get Alzheimer's later in life. So back to Jay's question, here's what happens. The poor person that gets the brain injury will set off Alzheimer's earlier than they would have gotten it otherwise. So instead of getting Alzheimer's disease when they're 75 or 80 years of age, if they have a brain injury at age 30, they may start showing signs of Alzheimer's disease when they're 50 or 55 years old. Okay, Bob, I want to go a little, let's, let's take that a little step further, and let's take the person who's been in this auto accident. They've had the neurosurgery. They do have the E4 or we'll take Mary's daughter, perhaps, who has this, the, the head injury. How does one go about actually finding someone like you uh, in their community, or are, are there a limited number of people like you, with neuropsychiatrists? There are a limited number. Uh, the first place I would, I would look is the Brain Injury Association of the United States, uh, uh, Brain Injury USA, uh, which is a family oriented national organization that has segments in every state in the country and is an advocacy group for uh, families or persons who've had brain injury and they have databases of individuals in a particular state who are, are helpful and can be of assistance to families or victims of brain injury. So I would start there. Uh, the other place is probably, uh, depending on where you live, uh, to go to one's medical school uh, because most neuropsychiatrists in the United States are not in private practice. Most today are in medical schools. We haven't turned out enough of them to, to have a lot in private practice. So going to one's medical school would be a good place to start. Uh, those would be the two best ways, Jay, to find someone to help, either through the Brain Injury uh, Association or see if there's a neuropsychiatrist in one's medical school. Okay, and if I ended up at a at a general psychiatrist's office, would that person pretty much routinely refer me on to a, a neuropsychiatrist? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, here's the bad news about our profession. Uh, the profession of psychiatry is only now waking up to the fact that we have 3 million traumatic brain injuries a year in the United States, and psychiatry has neglected this area. Uh, there are some of us that have embraced it and have for, the, for many years, but it's been an orphan in our profession. It's just now 
uh, being paid attention to by psychiatrists. So my point in this, Jay, is you could go to an excellent general psychiatrist in any uh, community in the United States, and they might not know much about traumatic brain injury, and they might not even know who in their community could help. All right, we're going to be going to break. We're going to talk about treatment options when we come back from the break on psychiatry. Ask the expert, Dr. K and Dr. Graniker. Helping you make informed decisions for your life. This is Voice America Health and Wellness. Hey, how you doing? Educational videos, top quality, right here. You'll never hear anyone selling education on the street. But with free family learning programs, you can get the education you need. Call 1-877-FAMLIT-1 for information on free learning programs. 1-877-FAMLIT-1. Check it out, check it out. We your GED right here, guaranteed, ma. Come on, check it out. Free family learning programs from the National Center for Family Literacy. Brought to you by the National Center for Family Literacy and the Ad Council. When you combine energy secrets from ancient China and the latest breakthroughs in medicinal science, you get power healing with Dr. Shaw. Heard every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time on Voice America Health and Wellness. Each week, Dr. Shaw will bring you another step closer to the expanding world of body space medicine. You will quickly learn and appreciate how power healing is a perfect alternative to hospitals and expensive drugs. Take a step beyond modern medicine every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time with Dr. Shaw on power healing right here on Voice America Health and Wellness. Growing Up in America explores the challenges, risks, benefits, and differences this generation of children face each day. Hosted by veteran pediatric emergency physician and father of four, Dr. Charles Nzika, this show is for parents, teens, and children. It crosses each generation. By exploring the unique aspects of matriculation within this current generation, we hope to find answers and ways of optimizing this experience for today's generation. Growing Up in America with Dr. Charles Nozika broadcasts each Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Do you know how health insurance is supposed to work and why some believe it's not working correctly? To find realities behind the myths, log on each Thursday at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time to Voice America Health and Wellness for Inside Health Insurance in America with Sharon Alt. Every show will peel back another layer of how health insurance has, could, and should work in America to benefit employers, employees, insured, and uninsured. You will also hear from industry insiders and high-ranking government officials. So join us every Thursday at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time for Inside Health Insurance in America, right here on Voice America Health and Wellness. Increase the quality of your life by decreasing the chances of disease and disability. Listen to Age Management Medicine in the 21st Century every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. On the show, host Dr. Harvey S. Bartnoff will discuss how to optimize your health span through hormone therapy, preventative medicine, proper nutrition, and more. Improve your vitality. Enjoy your life. Listen to Age Management Medicine in the 21st Century with Dr. Harvey S. Bartnoff every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern right here on Voice America Health and Wellness. Opinions, options, answers. Voice America Health and Wellness. Welcome back to Psychiatry, Ask the Expert. If you have a question or comment, dial toll-free at 1-866-369-3742. Now back to the show, here's Dr. K. Welcome back to Psychiatry, Ask the Expert. Dr. Granica, we're going right into it. Talk to us about treatment and the medications for a brain injury. Break it out however you want for the audience. Well, Neil, I think to make it simple, let's break it into two areas, cognitive and behavioral. Now, let's say you've got a family member that was in a car wreck, had a brain injury, and they have difficulty with memory, they're irritable, uh, their personality seems to have changed a bit. What you can offer is two things. Uh, there's emerging evidence that, Shortly after the injury, if you put the person on Namenda, N-A-M-E-N-D-A, you can alter that glutamic acid chemical that I told our audience about earlier. Uh, then uh, most brain injury units now are using what are called cognitive enhancers. These are drugs like Aricept, 
Exelon and a drug that used to be marketed as Reminil. Uh, these enhance acetylcholine in the brain and, and seem to help memory because the hippocampus, our memory center, is often affected in brain injury. Then let's move to the behavior part. Behavior is a bit more difficult. Some people end up with what's called a frontal lobe syndrome where they develop outlandish behavior, antisocial type behavior, don't follow directions, don't plan, don't pay attention to themselves or anybody else. That's very difficult to treat and probably requires a special kind of psychotherapy, in other words, talk therapy, uh, with a skilled therapist in a brain injury unit that can help the individual begin to monitor their own behavior and pay attention to their own behavior and try to adjust that way. Then there's another behavioral issue that is quite frequent following brain injury, and that's depression. Now, Neil, as you know, you and I uh, treat depression as general psychiatrists. That's, uh, that's the, the bread and butter diagnosis of psychiatry. But the depression that occurs after brain injury is much more difficult to deal with. It often will respond to the same antidepressants we use for ordinary clinical depression, but in some cases it may not. And you may have to add uh, mood-altering type medicines, uh, such as Lamictal or Depakote, uh, medicines that are more into the uh, anti-seizure realm but are used to modulate or regulate behavior in uh, humans with depression, bipolar illness, and traumatic brain injury. So those would be the basic approaches. Okay, so you're talking about antidepressants, uh, the drugs that we use for Alzheimer's, uh, the mood-stabilizing anti-seizure medicines. Uh, let's throw in one other category. What about the use of antipsychotics or atypical antipsychotics in these people? That probably should be reserved for uh, individuals that have very severe illness that can't be managed any other way or who develop a post-traumatic psychosis, which is rare but does occur. Here's why we tend to avoid those. Uh, there is a scientific evidence based on using a drug called Haldol that if you use that in a person after a brain injury, you actually retard improvement of cognitive function or may even retard healing of brain. Now, the newer drugs, drugs like Zyprexa and Seroquel and Risperdal, probably would have some of the same properties as Haldol. Therefore, I'm a little cautious about using those following a brain injury unless a person's behavior is so disturbed we can't control it any other way. There's another category of drugs that neither you nor I mentioned, Neil, that we also should throw in here, and that's the stimulants, uh, the amphetamine Ritalin type drugs. Because following brain injury, sometimes people are so anergic or lacks energy and drive to the point that stimulants can be helpful to them. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask you about stimulants. In fact, I just written down acquired attention deficit disorder. What do you think? It does occur. Uh, it's not the same as what occurs in children, but uh, it, by acquired you mean it's a result of the traumatic brain injury, and you can end up with substantial attentional deficits. That's because most of our attention, Neil, comes from the frontal parts of our brain, and those are the most likely parts to be injured in a traumatic head injury. Bob, let me bring you full circle here on this, because I, we opened tonight's show with a radar segment article about a large multi-million dollar study done by NIH. Uh, my question is, a lot of the, the drugs that you talk about would be certainly outside the package insert by the manufacturers. What does it take for someone in your position to kind of validate the use of a product in your patient population? Like how, how often are studies done and, and who do you look for to do research in this area? Very good question, Jay. Uh, when the, uh, the other term the audience uh, needs to know about is off-label. Uh, when we're using a drug that the FDA didn't approve for its use, uh, that's called using it off-label. We're not following the label of the manufacturer. And I want to make sure the audience understands almost everything I've discussed is off-label, and their doctor using these drugs would be using them outside of what the FDA said they could be used for. Having said that, that's done in medicine all the time. And to answer your question, uh, we don't have a good research base on what I just told our audience. Nobody is doing research to speak of on how to treat brain injury. You know, I want to state again, 3 million 
head injuries a year in the United States, and it's almost impossible to find any good research anywhere uh, in terms of drugs that will help people. Uh, so we have no choice but to use the drugs off-label. Now, the way we learn about this, Jay, is uh, ba- basically personally using them on brain injury units and see how people do. Okay, because uh, I'm familiar with Neil's work. I know he did uh, a study some years ago with a group of, I believe it was 14 patients in traumatic brain injury. So I, I know the studies aren't... aren't yeah, involved. I know Neil's done that, but, boy, if you try to find good studies on uh, drugs, it's it's very hard to do. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I agree with Bob. We need a lot more research in this area. Bob, I want to thank you for coming into the end of the show. Uh, it's been a great show. The time has just flown. Hope we'll be able to get you back. Uh, again, in the future, always want to remind uh, our listeners uh, about the take-home points. Uh, first off, mild brain injury isn't really necessarily mild in terms of how it affects people. A, a mild injury may, in fact, uh, change a person's personality or behavior and have significant effects. Uh, you do not need to lose consciousness to have a brain injury, uh, and your scans might be negative or normal, and that doesn't mean that you don't have an injury. No drugs or alcohol. Remember, you only get one brain. You need to treat it gently. Uh, I know it's hard, especially for our young athletes, to hear us say, look, you've had a concussion. You've got to stay out of the game. Up here, we have a lot of ice skaters. They hit the hard ice. We tell them they can't uh, can't go back. Reference organizations uh, and the websites. D-I-A-U-S-A.org, the Brain Injury Association of America, USA.org, uh, HealthyMinds.org, N-A-M-I.org, N-I-M-H.org. I want to thank the listeners for participating, Dr. Granifer, Granifer for being our guest. Next week we're going to do post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. K and Jay Birch saying thank you from Psychiatry, Ask the Expert on VoiceAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to Psychiatry, Ask the Expert. To learn more about Dr. K, visit courtpsychiatrist.com. Tune in next Tuesday for another hour of Psychiatry, Ask the Expert with Dr. Neil K.